good afternoon good evening and uh, good morning even uh, everyone who has joined us uh, for this uh, CXO disrupt reimagine your customer webinar today november 18 2020 it had been a very very interesting journey so far and uh, some of you may have caught our first session about reimagine Uh, retail and this is a uh, the second session that we are doing uh, specifically focusing about reimagine your customer speaking a little bit about this particular topic we thought it's probably the most relevant and uh, contemporary topic today and uh, i'm sure that you are seeing on the screen our esteemed uh, panelists who have joined us uh, we have representation from microsoft we have representation from sap we also have our own ceo from john kills it we have a very important customer uh, from magenta uh, that is magenta group milhan the group ceo joining us uh, today as well to get the session starting i would just like to play one video just to introduce our session why we came up with this disrupt and then maybe give a contextual understanding and kick off the session um, let me just get the video going uh, and then we will start the session immediately afterwards and thank you so much i hope uh, you got the message i think there will be a couple of things from that video as well i think we would love to explore with ramesh especially about the jkt transact jkt transform jkt engage jkt in a way that might be very important for uh, this particular topic that we are going to uh, speak about um so without any further ado i would just like to uh, kind of maybe make a quick introduction about the three panelists uh, four panelists we have uh, today on our session and then basically we'll uh, going to move forward uh, to the uh, any other kind of a uh, conversation that we would like to have uh, we have bruno uh, who is the general manager of one commercial uh, partner microsoft from middle east we also have patrick who is head of uh, general business middle east south uh, is for sap ramesh shamugunathan who is the group cio for john kills holdings we also have milhan who is the group ceo of magenta group uh, good afternoon gentlemen and welcome thank you so much for joining um, to get the program moving forward uh, i would just like to invite 
Ramesh, for you to uh, kind of provide a bit of an opening remarks, and then we'll get the opening remarks from the rest of the panelists to start off, and then we will uh, kind of move into the little bit of an in-depth conversation about the uh, reimagining your customer. What does it really mean, and how is it that we really need to be addressing that? Ramesh, over to you. Thanks, Rohan, and uh, good day to all of you. I think uh, we thought reimagine uh, your customer would be a pertinent topic, uh, especially post-pandemic, uh, when uh, a lot of the rules, assumptions on based on which that we ran our business have changed. Right. So today, more than uh, any time uh, in the past. A lot of people are talking about customer centricity and customer experience as a primary focus, uh, mainly because today the power has shifted significantly to the consumer, right? And one might ask why, right? So today, I think uh, the world that we live in has not changed much. We have been in a connected world. Uh, customer has been always connected, but our assumptions as to how the customer would engage us was very different, right? And all of a sudden, post pandemic, we we woken up to an era where customer is like the focal point, right? Everything is revolving around around them, and it, it was in the past as well. But we've come to realize that they have more power than we thought that they had. So all of a sudden, now we are clamoring in terms of understanding them better, trying to understand their journeys, their frictions. Uh, why would they come back to us, right? So today, I think a lot of us are also understanding that loyalty is a, a pretty misplaced phenomena today, right? And we are talking about hyper relevance. So what does hyper relevance mean? Right? So hyper relevance is all about building purpose in terms of a, a, a consumer, right? Understanding and relating in terms of why a customer would uh, do business with you in terms of uh, why, what is the relationship that they have to your organization. And in that, they also are looking for a partnership, a two-way partnership. They want to be part of your organization. And in doing so, they also then looking for some kind of protection in terms of accountability for them to share their data so that you could give them a personalized experience, right? So customer safety is all about whether you organize and make a decision in terms of whether it be strategic, tactical or operational, put it the customer at the core. And customer experience is all about then how do you leverage that in building personalized products and services was in the past, but today a customer is looking for probably an idea or an experience, right? not for a product or a service. Right? So that shift, how as an organization we could translate from a product or service only organization in, in being able to sell an idea or an experience. That's the whole theme that we would want to explore. And uh, uh, we're very happy to have you on board and, and to have this event with pretty experienced panelists in Bruno and Patrick, as well as Milhan uh, being a customer himself. Oji Roha. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think you absolutely said that I do have a couple of uh, already a couple of things to explore with you about some of the words you move, you move, uh, used here called hyper relevance. Uh, but of course, uh, before that, I think it's really uh, completely agree. We have a very experienced and very senior uh, panelist today, and we are very blessed to have them. Uh, Bruno, I'm coming to you. Uh, would you like to? Uh, we would like to hear your opening remarks and thoughts before we get into uh, the details of this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you, thank you, everybody. Um, first of all, good afternoon to everyone, and thank you for joining us. And uh, let me thank, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me this afternoon to uh, try to share uh, any kind of insight and also getting insight from Patrick, Milan, and, and you guys. So um, really, really delighted for me and honored to be with you for this uh, 90 minutes coming. Before I go, first of all, I hope um, the whole uh, people around these calls are safe, staying safe, make sure they are 
they are well, uh, I would say, uh, surrounded by, by their beloved ones and everything will be safe for the for the next one. I'm not sure we are post-pandemic, pre-pandemic, in the middle of the pandemic. Everybody's a bit lost wherever we are in this uh, in this scenario, but uh, uh, I, I really hope that you're all safe. Um, I, I think, first of all, uh, it's an, an immense pleasure and I think very valuable for, for me as, as a, I would say, IT player, part of Microsoft, to uh, share the floor with Patrick from SAP uh, as two partners, two IT ecosystem player, and also be uh, lucky enough to have a Milan from the customer side and from you guys, from the, I would say, delivery consulting side. So I think uh, with all of us, uh, four type of, I would say, uh, different part of the ecosystem. Uh, I hope we will help the, the people to uh, grow, understand, and maybe get insight. Um, it's unfortunate that we cannot do that in public and get insight from the people. Hopefully, we'll have some uh, Q and A's. Um, back to the subject about um, what happened these days and the fact we'll cover that. I assume with all the questions and the, and the discussion between us. But I think <clears throat> you made the point, Ramesh, about let, let's make sure that that we reflect ourselves and the, and the place of the customer. Uh, and by customer could be the customer of the customer uh, in, in how do we manage that, how do we reorganize ourselves, how do we make them, I would say, uh, central to what we're doing every day. I think also the second thing for me is, uh, and I'm also I think we can cover that, is how as a, as a leader in this organization, a couple of hundreds of people reporting to me in, uh, let's say, 70 countries, what do we do for our people? How do we support our people? How do we manage them? How do we uh, coach them? I think uh, hopefully we'll cover that. And last but not least, uh, we need to make all of this work because uh, all of those IT are here to deliver value, deliver success, uh, bring business outcome. Uh, could be a business, as I said, but could be also a, a customer experience, a customer support, etc. So um, really happy to be with you. Thank you very much for having me and um, looking forward to a great discussion with my colleagues and friends here. Rohan, you're on mute. Rohan, you're Yep, now I'm back. Thanks, Ramesh. Thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, got a little excited over there. Um, so I think one of the things I would like to say is, uh, you know, it's really, really interesting uh, that uh, some of the thoughts, Bruno, you uh, obviously mentioned as the opening remarks, and we would definitely get back to you with some more details on those each of these areas. Uh, of course, next up is Patrick. Before Patrick starts, I would just like to say is that uh, this particular uh, session is uh, on live on Microsoft Teams for everyone who have registered. We are also live streaming on Facebook. Um, so if any of you have any questions, uh, now is a good time for you all to start thinking about it before you uh, get into it. But I would rather recommend that you wait for a bit longer to get into a little bit more detail. We have very interesting uh, line of questions and clarifications that we would like to get into with all of these uh, very professionals in the panel today. Patrick, over to you for your opening remarks. Yeah, thanks, Rohan. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, in this uh, in this panel today, um, so my name is Patrick. I look after SAP's uh, mid-market business uh, here in the region, um, and of course, I'm passionate and enthusiastic um, about uh, providing cloud services uh, to the mid-market space. And it's uh, very good to see, of course, that this uh, space has been resilient uh, despite the crisis. Um, we see that um, the way customers behave has shifted, um, the, the, the way that they interact uh, with their suppliers has shifted, e-commerce is changing, and of course uh, the way that people shop um, has changed. And in this environment, um, we are uh, there to provide services to uh, help uh, customers uh, uh, transform digitally and uh, keep the lights on, and I think that's uh, the most important part. So I'm very happy to be here in, as part of this panel today, and uh, I'm looking, yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion um, and uh, to the different viewpoints that we will have uh, from this panel. Oh, I certainly am looking forward to this conversation, and because you know why, I'm really excited to have Milhan uh, joining us for this session. Because you know why, technically all of us are serving him as a customer. So I think uh, Milhan, I hope uh, uh, you could uh, unmute yourself. Uh, what I would like to have is a couple of moments because I'm sure that, that over the last couple of months you are in the thick of things and you have uh, worked with all three uh, more or less uh, representations here. Uh, we would like to hear your thoughts about you know what is mean as a customer. What would you like to see from all of us to reimagine 
uh, for yourself. Thanks, Rohan. Um, thank you so much um, uh, for everybody who's uh, brought me on to this um, discussion, as well as all those who are listening. Um, I'm really, guys, uh, uh, not much of an introduction kind of guy. I think Bruno was uh, very uh, elaborate in his uh, introduction. Um, my name is on the board for those uh, uh, who want to see it. Um, I'm attached to Magenta. Um, it's all about um, inspiring food as a lifestyle for the people who we try and uh, make a difference in their food lifestyle. This is what we try to do. As a company, we make um, a, a plethora of uh, products. Um, I think we're very good at it. Um, um, alhamdulillah, all praise due to God and uh, to the team, of course. Um, uh, we make everything from uh, smoked salmon to um, uh, some really good cooked uh, uh, beef bacon, breakfast sausages, pepperoni, etc. I don't want to bore you guys with a lot of uh, product lists. Um, with respect to uh, uh, all of uh, Rohan repeating, saying Milhan, Milhan. Guys, first of all, I'm I'm not a customer because I'm, I'm just somebody who's trying to serve a customer. And uh, people like Bruno and Patrick and uh, Ramesh, and Rohan and uh, their all entire teams, I think they're just trying to help me and my team so that we can try and um, serve the customers who are trying to um, uh, keep all of us um, in business as well as give us an opportunity to make a difference in their life. Um, with respect to the uh, presentation at hand, um, talking about reimagining a customer, even before that, um, when, when my sales team, for example, tells me, we've sold so much or we've achieved this or we brought in revenue, the first thing that I ask them is, did you sell or did you give it to somebody who is going to sell it to a customer? Because all of majority of the customers, whether it be a, a retail chain like Spinney's, whom we work with here, or the likes of them, or um, anyone from food service, um, the, the Hilton Hapsul Group, Emirates Palace, or um, uh, the Starwood Group Hotels, or IAG, or anybody whom we work with, um, all of these are the people who actually look after the customers. We're just trying to see how we can get it across to them. So I think in my view, that's where everything really starts to realize where the customer is and who in fact is a customer. Over to you, Rohan. And thank you again, everybody, for having me on board. Milhan, thank you so much. Uh, it's a incredibly interesting uh, words that you just mentioned there. Uh, thank you so much. So, I mean, I think we are going to start the webinar in uh, after the opening remarks. So what we have thought is more or less to divide this particular webinar into more or less like a three key broad areas we want to discuss around. Obviously, the first one being about customer centricity, second one being about customer value creation and the last phase of it being customer value delivery. We have limited time. Obviously, there's so much of experience around this uh, uh, panel. So we'll try to get to the thick of it. So Patrick, I'm coming to you probably uh, to open the uh, the webinar and maybe open up with the questions that we want to discuss. Uh, I think the, the concept of companies that put the customers at the heart of the organizations are, you know, experience an increase in customer lifetime value. And I think customer lifetime value is one of the key measures of, you know, that defined of acquisition of customers uh, and the retention part of it as well. Um, how do you think it has uh, changed over the last maybe one year or so uh, as a result of whatever is going on around the world? Yeah, so I think first of all, uh, I think it's been an ongoing trend, right? So since the beginning of the Internet age, uh, which is I think now 20, 25 years ago, uh, we've seen the trend that uh, customers have uh, more choice. Uh, they have uh, access to more information, which allows them to make more uh, informed uh, buying decisions and which puts the bargaining power uh, at their end of the table in many cases, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a buyer's market, essentially. Uh, so with more choice, you have more competition um, and uh, organizations need to uh, have a differentiator and they need to be able to serve the customers better than the competition uh, to win business. Uh, so I think this is where the customer centricity really comes in. And that's why it's so important um, because uh, the uh, power is with the customer and the consumer. Um, uh, during COVID, I think this has been um, this has been an accelerating trend. Um, so you need to reach your customers uh, in a digital way. You need to be able to deliver your goods and services uh, also during a lockdown. Uh, so resilience and agility is, uh, is key in this aspect. 
I think in our industry, in the uh, IT industry, we've been relatively fortunate, of course, because a lot of the work that we deliver to our customers can be done remotely. Um, so at SAP and also with our ecosystem, um, we've uh, been very quick to adopt uh, work from anywhere models um, that allows people to uh, deliver work uh, remotely. Uh, for instance, in, the, in, 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 in cloud projects, when a customer uh, deploys a new cloud solution, um, we, we have uh, deployment models where uh, the majority of that work is, uh, is delivered remotely. Um, and um, um, these projects are successful. Of course, in some cases, uh, it takes uh, a change in, in, uh, in uh, behavior, um, yeah. but there's also benefits to it, right? So one of the benefits, for instance, is that it reduces travel costs. So it, uh, there's a, there's a p and impact uh, on that side. And um, I think another important aspect, which goes back to the point that I made about uh, having more choice, is that customers can actually source services uh, globally Right. If you deliver remotely, uh, it, it mean, it'd be helpful if they wouldn't be 12 hours away in a different time zone. But if they're three, four or five hours away, um, it's not such a big deal. And uh, I'm sure you can make it work. And I think this, again, uh, translates to more uh, choice for the customer and more competition, uh, which essentially is good for the customer. Right. Um, so I think at the tail end of this uh, crisis, uh, we'll see um, that the customer behavior is, will have changed. Um, mm. All of our behavior will have changed and we will be in a position to uh, reap at least a few benefits uh, from that crisis. Interesting. Interesting thoughts, Patrick. I mean, I'll, we'll definitely get back to it. There's a lot more in, in that um, answer you gave. But I just want to kind of uh, connect on from the point that you mentioned. I think today we are also seeing, and I think let me come to uh, Bruno for this particular question. Uh, what we are seeing is really is the fact that, you know, there are multi channels. Um, people talk about this omni channel type of engagements from customers. Uh, you know, digital is booming. Um, so many different ways about meeting, uh, getting into the customers, but customers choose the channel they want to. And there are people are talking about conversational uh, e commerce, uh, all those different things. And what is really, really talking about is, uh, you know, services being delivered frictionless, uh, convenient, and, and, and more like personalized services. Uh, through the channel that customers are pulling it out of. Um, so I think, how do you see uh, this particular journey has evolved over the, I mean, over the last couple of years? And what do you think as technology providers that uh, that we all should be thinking about to ensure that we are catering to this demand? I think, uh, first of all, uh, Patrick has covered a few, few very important stuff about the fact, as you said, the, the sourcing, the multi-sourcing, the fact that now, almost anybody any partners can can deliver and you are a fantastic example of that uh, mr from uh, john keys i mean you are today working with us across the region and, uh, and you're delivering project where most probably you don't have necessarily uh, all the foot in grounds that you had in the past so i think uh, uh, it's very important for for our customers and most probably uh, the people that are listening to that that Geography is not is no more uh, uh, problems. Okay? We have lots of partners that that I personally engage, where we've built something out of Middle East, and we're talking those people, taking those people, sorry, uh, to the US, to Europe, to APAC in a very, I would say, easy and seamless way. The the so so that's the point. There is no more, I would say, barrier for business development. And I think with the current pandemic that we are in in the past week that has really accelerated, really accelerated. The second thing which I think uh, has increased from my view, uh, 10 years in the in the region here is this notion of time to market uh, that has been very, very fundamental today. And, and I, I was referring uh, in a customer discussion last week saying that it's really the king these days, okay? You, you can't be late. Uh, you have to be timely because market and opportunities are to be there. So for us, what does that mean? And for and for ecosystem player, what does that mean? We need to be simpler. We need to crack technology partnership. And that's why Patrick and, uh, and, and, uh, and myself are, are really engaged into the deep core and engineering partnership between SAP and Microsoft, where our both technical team has really connected the dots to make sure that we have something seamless, almost ready to use. So this notion of before we had to pre-build, build, build, uh, build practices, build product, customize. 
I think these days say, listen guys, I need to reach my customer now uh, and faster, or I need or I need to reach my employee faster. So so that's the, so the simpler partnership, which is linked to this also is this notion of easy to deploy, easy to access back of uh, Patrick points. And for us, for example, we have completely changed um, our, um, I will say, online footprint. Uh, in my own uh, department, we've changed all our online visibility, but also we have made available to all our customers worldwide any IP, uh, so intellectual property based on our cloud, being available to those guys through, uh, I will say, a well-known uh, marketplace on, on our cloud platform. So making it easy to access. The, the third thing I think that really have changed is, and that might surprise a couple of people, is I think we were pushed as the ecosystem player uh, to really be far more precise and tune the customer priority. Okay, and not necessarily from a technical engagement, but also from their, I would say, own employee. Look at uh, how do the customers had to, uh, I would say, work with working from home in what 72 hours, 48 hours. Uh, for us, for example, in the education sector, we had to put millions of people behind these beautiful teams in less than 48 hours, in less than a weekend. Okay, so it can it could have been very complex in the past, uh, four or five years ago, to have this reactivity. And last but not least, what we see and really we see it accelerating, and uh, I didn't have a chance to share that with Milan, but for, for sure I would do is that more of our customers, so end customer, with cloud adoption become our partners because we create IP together and then we realize there is a market for that IP and then slowly and slowly some of our customers becomes our partners and then we can take them to market together. Couple of examples in logistics, couple in, uh, in uh, example in retails and in FSI. So well, that's I would say the way we see evolving or at least I am experiencing it when I, when I meet with customers and partners. Time to market really focusing on priority and simplicity from a customer side and opening the door for new business model, new business practice with the end customer that slowly can become our partners. Excellent. Uh, Bruno, I just wanted to, I mean, that's a very interesting point. Let me, I mean, I think to be, to be to, so, to some great extent, uh, there's a, there's a two division, two types of, uh, I mean, panelists I see, there's a B2B kind of a thing. And then they, obviously we also have a B2C kind of a flavor with uh, Milhan here. So let, Milhan, let me just come to you. Some of the things that, uh, that Patrick and Bruno echoed uh, about, you know, simplification, customer centricity, frictionless, digital channels. Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that, you know, there had been a, it, it is a, very complicated on on to deploy and to really kind of get organization uh, kind of changed around uh, uh, you know to deliver that value to the customers i know for a fact that i myself was involved with engaging with you for about one year you know to get to where we are today it's a long complex process a lot of changes are required would you talk to us and explain a little bit about how you are seeing the customer centricity in the current context for your uh, industry and overall and what are you all seeing as an organization that needs to be really be as a priority for you? Well, Rohan, I think um, <clears throat> uh, there's, there's no doubt that uh, technology plays uh, a key role in terms of getting things, uh, whether it be information or services or even a product across to somebody and even on the opposite side in terms of understanding what a customer really wants. But from our perspective, if you um, uh, ask me, um, uh, if I if I take a couple of minutes just to draw um, some kind of a relevance to this uh, pandemic as a whole, it is yeah, quite yeah. unfortunate that you do have these type of uh, things. Uh, these are beyond man's control um, and bring certain, um, uh, in my view, balances uh, to the uh, economies of scale and how the world as a whole operates. Um, that being said, um, I, I personally and very strongly believe that people usually have this habit of attributing success to themselves. And if you look at any professional, you'd find that in his resume, he'd probably say, you know, during my tenure at this organization or at this group level, I've managed to do this and then we moved the X percentage to Y and it grew at a gradient of growth of this percentage or something of this uh, sort. I opened up these markets or we did something which was or we had all of these NPDs and R&Ds and everything. 
but then when you have something which is in your favor if we are going to attribute it to ourselves um i really don't understand the concept of attributing um a, a backward trend or a failure to succeed in, in a time frame to the circumstances so yeah. it's it's almost like when 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 i fail then i say it's covid that made this happen but then when i am successful as an organization i i attribute it to myself and then say i managed to do these things yes it is true that this is something of force major um, magnitude and is bigger than most of us and i believe no one who's alive who's alive today or in this um uh, century has ever seen something um of of this uh, magnitude nevertheless there is a lot of momentum which is happening behind the screens and whilst the circumstances are absolutely the same for many of the organizations there have been some great number of organizations who have just used this to leap to extreme extents whilst the others have been around this curtain that they have been bringing in in front of them by saying well it's covid well it's a pandemic well it's global well it's this well it's that if yeah, you look yeah. at those uh, companies as opposed to these comparison companies which actually did not do very well and if we focus a moment on those companies i think they were looking to see how they could bring in certain amount of transformation but i believe whilst also not disrupting their entire flywheel momentum in terms of what they as a business were trying to do because there there is a third segment in between which tried to in my view um understand customer centricity and align it during this pandemic but what happened was they kind of got um derailed from their fundamental core drive um and trying to do things and they thereby failed for example if you take certain companies which had uh, a niche market or a very specific expensive product that was their forte and when this uh uh pandemic kicked in and everybody started going online and everybody started offering their services and products in whatever form on on a, a digital platform which was contactless and everything a lot of those companies also try to adopt these i believe the term here is a more reactive engagement from their side and they did not exactly understand is this what my customer exactly would like to have but rather they thought okay everybody else is going on this platform there must be something to this platform and they tried to make uh, a change in their flywheel too soon too fast too much and uh, it almost crashed to the extent that they had to rotate it 180 degrees in the wrong uh, in in the other direction so right, i right. think it's very important for every service provider or product manufacturer to clearly understand what does my customer need regardless of what the circumstances are right excellent me that thank you so much for that input i think some other things uh, connects back to something that i've been reading recently called the first principle of thinking without really looking at iterative really asking yourself what does it that customers are really looking for and how are we to be able to construct that to meet that expectation without really thinking about the iterative process of let's just put everything what we be doing in a physical to put it on digital channel which probably could be a formula for disaster ramesh i know you have been quiet uh, hopefully not for long i'm just coming to you i think you know you have been um, uh, we have heard uh, from patrick bruno and milhan very interesting thing i want to take the conversation for a for slightly a little bit on the customer centricity um, just to add some flavor to this a uh, lot of times today uh, you know when we talk about all of these digital platforms and all that what it is really uh, telling us is that there's a, a significant portion of data that have been left behind uh, by uh, customers and uh, you know everyone and uh, this particular how are we really kind of analyze using this data to get a 360 degree uh, view of the customer profiles organizations what is this omni channel i would just like to hear your thoughts about the comments uh, the other three panelists made and also just kind of tilt our conversation towards a little bit on the on the data part of it as well ramesh i i would probably like to stitch the comments made by patrick bruno and milhan 
uh, rightly so i think they had different view points coming from uh, different perspective now if i were to start from what Bil- uh, wilhan mentioned that he is not actually selling to a customer right so so that brings me to a very interesting debate as to who is your customer right so i am of the view a customer is not really the end customer who consumes your product or service it could be everyone who touches your product or a service and who is giving life to it it could be your employees it could be your partners it could be your suppliers it could be your promoters it could be your critics could be your uh, guys who talk about your brand in the social media because it is today a customer is anyone who impacts your product or a service in terms of uh, a perception in terms of influencing someone to to consume that or even even this is from it right so having said that the whole equation even even from mehran's point of view okay magenta manufactures and distributes something and it probably goes to shops goes to hotels go to horeca whatever the channels and it ultimately gets consumed right so the the question is as a manufacturer what kind of information do we have about the entire value chain or the value ecosystem right so are we are we producing items in terms of what the what we know the market wants or what we really know the customer wants to consume okay. given the choice to a customer would he ask for something else so that is the question about the customer centricity right so a lot of the time we assume this is what the customer wants and we produce something and we know it gets consumed but right. if we were to stop pause and ask the customer hey mr customer what is that you prefer to consume right are we in a position to deliver that product or a service so it's about reverse engineering the whole value chain and say so our our entire value chain as the porters is is starts from the raw material right and we have process manufacture value add then we sell right that's that's the porters value chain so when you break that value chain and say hey there is no value chain now there is this value ecosystem and customers sitting in they say hey today i i feel like eating maybe some fish steaks with some different flavor so can i can i can i engineer this menu and say deliver this in in a in a round right that is the power of customer sensitivity so today the uber i station all of that has what has done to the world it is really broken the value chain philosophy to pieces so there are no more value chain right so you are saying a, a, a customer can create a value ecosystem right because of the power of mobiles and the power of connected world and the connected customer so today i can log on to an application right can order whatever i want get it delivered by someone pay through some other means and i can create a value ecosystem which i i want no one else determines that right so if someone can give me that power i would gravitate towards that right so that is the whole thing in terms of customer centricity the disruptive opportunity is because you are connected and you are part of the connected ecosystem so who can get visibility in terms in terms of who you are that's what i said in terms of in terms of pride why do you want to be associated with the brand are you being considered as a partner of that brand not as a just a guy who just consumes that service right and do you feel safe with the brand yeah. right and do you see personal service so all of that is about what you said ultimately boils down to data driven organization how much of data do i have about or that brand has about me to personalize right so today i think milhan has taken a pretty uh, kind of a, a bold step in terms of even amidst the pandemic to invest into sap with microsoft on azure to set the ball rolling in terms of putting the as the transact the transform pieces in place to enable a customer centric journey forward right so that is what what we are talking about 
ultimately the pandemic poses a challenge is that it also gives opportunities for people to rethink and remodel their way in terms of becoming a data driven organization great ramesh i mean i think there's some very interesting things about it and it kind of nicely segue into a into the question that i wanted to ask from bruno but before i proceed uh, for everyone who's uh, you know listening to us feel free to leave your questions with us we'll happy to take them on uh, very real you will find uh, such a galaxy of stars uh, appearing on a webinar um, so i think uh, happy to have any questions uh, raised here and take it uh, uh, to the panelist as well uh, but what a very important question is that before i if I get into the other question bruno i want to ask a very important question connecting from what ramesh left out but is there anything that uh, milhan or patrick or bruno would you like to add to what ramesh said uh, agree to disagree yeah Rohan, um, if you would allow me um there was this nice article written by um sunil gupta who is affiliated to uh, harvard he's an economist and um, yeah, i believe it was an article that was published by um, harvard business review and uh, under the title of um, something like are you um, really trying to innovate around your customers needs in that he brings um some uh, examples from yeah. those is the uh, idea of how would uh, a fuel station look like going forward in the future what right. would you imagine the fuel station of the future to look like now um uh, i know we are against time but just to um get the uh, thought ball process uh, rolling if i could yeah. quickly get each one of you guys please to give me a quick answer to that how would you imagine the future uh, fuel station to be like <laughs> oh interesting question <laughs> who wants to take that one i am i will be station because we will we will go on most of the renewable energies and you will have a fuel station at your home Bruno, okay. Rohan. No, I am a moderator. I'm. I'm usually. <laughs> you still talking? <laughs> He keeps talking, uh, Milan. You, you know him for long now. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what so the. You are not become the moderator now. <laughs> I don't know what the fuel station would be because I don't, I'm not sure. I, I know what the future would be, but for sure already the fuel station is coming to my place in Dubai. Okay. So, uh, um, hold that Catherine. thought for a moment, uh, Patrick. Uh, uh, sorry, Bruno. Patrick. Uh, yeah, I was actually go going to say the same thing that uh, Bruno <laughs> just mentioned. So, uh, us uh, two living in Dubai. um and of course uh, this is a very service oriented uh, economy here you have uh, um services that don't exist elsewhere um and a lot of uh, customers are asking for convenience so what we have here is a service uh, there's actually multiple now but the the, the one that came in first was uh, uh kafu so they have an app where you uh, basically say that your car needs to be fueled you can leave your car in the driveway and they come at 3 o'clock in the morning to refill your car and then uh, everything gets transacted through your credit card so i think that's an amazing uh, example actually of customer centricity and of course they captured a new um, ma market uh, trend there you go patrick and bruno they let the cat out of the bag thank you so much guys <laughs> all right um uh, i think it's a reality that um the uh, uh, the current sustain model of um, energy for the moment at least i don't know for how many years to go in the future is going to be that we going to have to be at these fuel stations but when everybody i'm sure the, these answers what um uh, patrick and uh, bruno said they are exactly what uh, my question was about and that's what sunil was talking about in the article as well but just imagine this question being thrown at you 10 years before today would we yeah, right. exactly have come up with the same answer uh, a lot of us would have been thinking as did a lot of big um, uh, conglomerates they think when they said um, we want to put convenience at the store so we want to put an atm we want to put a starbucks a mini starbucks we want to put something else a small uh, uh, mini mart we want to make these things available and then uh, dunking donuts or any of this but did the question the key question when we are talking about are we really innovating around our customers needs how many actually thought does the customer really want to come to the fuel station when that question was asked 
instead of seeing how we could put a mini Starbucks or a mini Dunkin' Donuts store inside of the fuel station, the entire answer was about how do we get fuel to the customer conveniently, safely, without him having to be there. And as it was mentioned, Kafu, they've done it with a simple app. You don't even have to be there. All you have to do is just book and then you leave your car. I don't think they refuel if you are underground in a basement parking, but as long as you're outside and it is safe to fuel, then they do it and you don't even have to be there to see it. You just have to leave the fuel lid or whatever open. So I believe Rohan, um, Patrick and uh, Bruno, they answered uh, what I had to say. <laughs> so, uh, um, at least I'm glad that I was not part of the answering panel on, for that one, Milan, because I would have not got it right for sure. <laughs> but I mean, I think it's really interesting that what you just said kind of really kind of ushers us into the area that I want to touch upon for the next phase, which is about value creation. You um, kind of uh, touched very nicely about this fuel, uh, you know, stations and how does the value creation process happens now. Um, but I think I want to just come to you, Bruno, about uh, specifically about this particular one and also kind of falling back from what Ramesh mentioned. When it comes to value creation, I mean, oftentimes, you know, we talk about systems and processes, which to great extent is complex and difficult, but there is a way, there's a method to the madness, there's a way that answers, there are plenty of support from organizations such as Microsoft and SAP and, you know, even you know, to get that support. But one of the very important things that oftentimes doesn't get addressed properly is the mindset and the, the parameters around culture of our organization about, you know, this uh, value creation part of it. I would just like to hear your thoughts about how do you think current, excuse me, modern day organizations uh, should go about creating the mindset parallel to the systems and processes uh, that need to get deployed, the culture need, need to be organization uh, to really be able to create some great amount of value uh, uh, generation inside the organization. Bruno? Yeah, I guess. So first of all, uh, it's, uh, I would say, it's a far more complex questions than most probably what we have said before. Because finding, finding technology, finding new markets, new, uh, new customers sometimes, not easy, but I would say uh, we, we managed to do it. But changing the culture, or if not changing, trying to reverse and trying to adapt culture of our own organization. And the bigger we are, the, the complexities, I'm sure Patrick will, uh, will agree, uh, looking at the size of our organization. But uh, so, yeah, I guess uh, it, it is a journey, by the way, that uh, the corporation uh, here at Microsoft has been thinking along. And, and I would say since Satya joined us, uh, a vast majority of his work, of his work has been around mindset. Okay. Uh, and by mindset, what, what, what we mean or what do we mean? And, and what I think makes sense is that the mindset of every individual and that um, as an individual, I need to uh, very likely listen more, be empathic more, give time to think more. Uh, and I think that that seems to be the basics uh, for, for, I would say, for vast majority of, of, of what we think. But the reality, uh, I could listen even more. And that's listen internally and externally. I think we, just, we touch point the external part uh, a bit earlier. The second step is, uh, I guess, an organization, an, an organization like us, 40 years, uh, 50 years in the market. I mean, we have uh, we have our own a priori. Okay, we we think we know. We we, we have our business model that are well working. Um, reality is that sometimes we are challenged, and definitely we're challenged these days. And lucky the IT uh, the IT market is uh, is well I would say uh, positively impacted by this. But that's this notion of uh, most probably you've heard this between being fixed mindset or growth mindset. And how can I make sure that I I try to erase my legacy thinking, my legacy barrier to say how can I take me and therefore my team to a new level, okay? And and make sure that what was a problem or a challenge can be solved very differently. That's the second point. And the third one is, uh, which is very clear, uh, which is very close uh, to my heart is because we need to enable, and I always use that word. I prefer when I say that we try to enable our team, not to coach them, etc. but really what is needed into that, that, that time is in terms of value creation is clarity. 
For me, bringing clarity at the center of everything, bringing clarity to roles and responsibility, bringing clarity to the value that we bring to customer, asking questions to get clarity from the from the end customer, uh, making sure that everything is clear from a product standpoint, from a, uh, I will say, proposition standpoint, make sure that we know where we're going, it's pretty clear, we have milestone, etc. So this mindset for me and value creation is, is really, I think, something at the heart And I would say, looking backwards, again, uh, uh, something like 15 years that I know Microsoft, I think if if Satya would not have, in, I would say, embed this notion of culture change, I think right. the, the overall value proposition of Microsoft would have been extremely different, despite the technology shift or despite the cloud, etc. Et so yeah, for us, and for me personally, top of mind every day. Uh, in the way I engage with my customers and, and my employees. Excellent. Does this make sense? Oh, that's great answer, Bruno. Thank you so much. And I think there's a question, uh, interesting question on the chat as well. We'll take it up in a bit later. But uh, Patrick, let me come to you now. And I think uh, one of the interesting things is that, you know, we, we see that people usually spend a lot of uh, dollars in terms of our R&D, marketing, sales, and, uh, you know, kind of really say, figuring out segments of markets, where are you best serve, uh, etc. Um, but is that really the way that, uh, is this the best way to go about doing this uh, for organization? Is there a different way of really approaching uh, this uh, particular greatest? Uh, how do you create the highest value uh, with the dollars you have uh, without really going after these existing segments and throwing R&D and marketing dollars and etc. What is your take on uh, that particular kind of uh, approach yeah I, i would think it depends on a couple of factors uh, so uh, i think one is a strategy do you want to be a niche player um, or do you want to expand into new uh, business areas uh, i think in both cases uh, you need to understand your market um, and you need to understand your customers right so if you're a niche player you need to most likely um, Uh, expand uh, the functionalities and capabilities of your products. You need to make them more appealing. You need to make them um, maybe more efficient, more long lasting, whatever it might be. So, but you still need to understand uh, the um, consumer behaviors and what, what the customer uh, wants. If you want to expand, um, of course, you need to understand uh, where to expand to, right? So uh, what are the market trends? Uh, do you want to go into new demographics, new customer segments? new geographies um, or new markets altogether. Also for that, you need to understand uh, the, um, the the target market uh, behavior and what the trends in the target market are. I think we've all seen um, companies uh, of the old industry uh, or old industry titans that have disappeared in, uh, in recent uh, uh, decades uh, uh, or who have been relegated to the second league. Um, and in most cases, it has to do with the fact that they didn't uh, see the shifts in, uh, in customer demand. And I think that's the important uh, second aspect is uh, how sensitive is your product or services to shifts in consumer needs. Um, and for that, for instance, we at SAP, we have um, a portfolio of products in the experience management uh, uh, space. Uh, which helps you understand better um, what customers are thinking about the service uh, or the product that you're providing um, in uh, in real time um, and of course across uh, the, the your, your consumer uh, population. So of course, yeah, let, technology plays a big role. In, so, sorry, go on. No, go ahead, Patrick. Sorry, I thought uh, there was a small delay. Go ahead. Yeah, so of course, uh, we as an IT organization believe that uh, it, it, it comes down to agility and responsiveness. Um, so, of course, uh, technology plays a big role here um, and uh, I think this crisis uh, has been evidence also that uh, companies that, ha that have already digitally transformed uh, and have adopted uh, technologies for their operations that they have a strong advantage in the market field. Excellent. Thank you, Patrick. I, I just wanted to have a, like an open question raised for, uh, for all four of you um, because the reason I think is that I think I'd love to hear the, the four opinions. Uh, everywhere I go, even here and everywhere, we are seeing that organizations who had been, you know, been particular certain way and this pandemic has been extended now for almost one year. A lot of organizations just does not have the capacity uh, to be able to, you know, survive this long with this kind of overheads. And they are, I mean, as you rightfully said, Patrick, there seems to be going out of business there. I mean, 
now that does mean that you have to pivot you have to enter new segments re- recreate reimagine innovate yourself completely uh, what are your thoughts about organizations having to do that and i think that really nicely connects well with our topic today which is reimagine your customer um, what are your thoughts about it maybe i'll just start with uh, ramesh and then come to milhan and come back to both of you uh, bruno and patrick ramesh yeah, i think it's a interesting question uh, you raised you know i think if you really look at whether pandemic has defined or or kind of uh, change the customer or has it changed your perspective of the customer right so the the, the i think my take is the customer's need was later right pandemic has shown about a later need which has become significant because he had to consume lot of this stuff from home like like the food right so it is either a pain or a friction which was not felt by the uh, supplier or the company was selling that still a product or service right and it became amplified because of a situational uh, pain or a friction right right so the the second question to ask is is there a possibility for us to reimagine in terms of anticipating a new need or a requirement of the customer right so the example which got cited in terms of fuel was a pain or a friction which was created by the pandemic right so it was it's not a so it's evolved to address a pain or a friction right so the the whole question that we also need to keep thinking about is we taken customer for granted in in lot of the aspects right so the question is because the data points what we have about the customer is in terms of our own transactions of our products and services right yeah. so what more do we know about this customer for us to then extrapolate and say hey this could be a, a, a nice product or a service which could complement what we are doing to this customer right or it could create the wow factor so the whole whole uh, appreciation is i think we got to stop thinking the value creation process is linear it's not not linear anymore right i could plug into a value ecosystem and enhance that value by whatever i could do like to uber right uber did not create any value right they don't create any assets they don't they own any assets all they all they did is create a platform for the for the supply and the consumer to meet right so the whole thing also probably they done the same thing right so the, the whole example for us to kind of all, all, all the cases for us to review is is there as an unfulfilled latent need which if we can fulfill at a scale can become a product or a service right. interesting perspective gentlemen anyone else would milham would you like to say something i see a question interesting question as well that i've been two interesting questions i'll read out the second question in a bit maybe we can just take it up before we move to the last segment because we have spent about 1 hour uh, discussing this topic mila would you like to add something well with respect to what was being asked uh, my response uh, would be in two parts the first one might surprise uh, you and the rest of the audience but this is the brutal fact a pandemic of this nature something unprecedented never experienced or witnessed by anyone who's alive uh, today um the answer to your first uh, the, the first part to your question uh, rohan would be uh, yeah. yes a lot of the companies are going to go they've already gone out of business they are going to go out of business um is there something that i could think of um which would help them not go out of business i'm sorry the first part of the answer is i i cannot think of anything they are going to go like i said this is um like a reset of balance um the economies of the world economics uh, will change and this was something um when uh, we started at, in uh, somewhere in jan when we were just hearing about this issue and i believe in one of the meetings uh, that the team and i had uh, i had uh, slightly mentioned this to them saying guys i have a feeling that this thing is going to change the world as we know it um so that's the first part um the second part is um if you look at uh, a company uh, which uh, 
I believe it was uh, Deepak Gagg who uh, brought up uh, the company called Rivigo in uh, India. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Um, Rivigo or Rivigo, whatever uh, the pronunciation. Um, it, this relates to what uh, partly Ramesh said in terms of trying to identify which part of a latent customer need has not been addressed. The other side of it, I would say, is where there is um, demand, but there is a lack of supply due to certain constraints. Now, what Deepak saw was there was a lot of um, e-commerce that was kicking in with Amazon and whatever the other platforms, but there was a scarcity, at, at least in India, where you got over a billion people, um, there was a scarcity in terms of the trucks uh, taking them there. Because truck drivers, um, due to the fact that they had to go uh, and travel large uh, hundreds or thousands of kilometers, um, and they had to spend uh, a lot of nights away from home, it is sad to say that they had to uh, indulge in a lot of uh, illicit and uh, unethical practices that kept them going, which uh, families did not approve of. So it was actually not something that people looked at uh, as a good thing. If somebody said I was a truck driver, it was actually not being viewed as a good thing, not because you were driving transportation because of the other um, wrong activities that were known to be associated with the people who were in that profession. So what Deepak thought was um, if we could get think of a way how we could get these guys to get back home on a daily basis every day in the night, we might be able to solve the problem. But how would you do that when you're trying to get something across from Delhi to, uh, um, uh, I don't know, Mumbai or some place, which is yeah. uh, essentially two, three, maybe four days of transportation distance. Then he said, okay, let me look at something which is going to be a drop-off model. So he said, if I could get every truck from one village to, from point A to go to point B, which is no more than four to six hours, and right. then the driver would drop it off at point B, pick up another truck from point B and drive it back to point A. So if you're looking at four plus four, that's eight, or if you're looking at six plus six, which is a bit of a stretch, but that's 12 hours. But you're back home with your family, you sleep, and then you do the same thing. And then this led to uh, a, a, an exponential saving brought in because the number of productive hours that the same truck could be used was multiplied multifold because of the fact if a driver was sleeping, he would sleep essentially in the truck. So the truck could not be commissioned. But now you've got a truck which is being driven by three other drivers while you're sleeping. So this, I think, converted that. It, it was a huge uh, demand which was there, but could not be supplied. He foresaw that and then applied it. And it, it I believe, now is a, a, a billion uh, dollar um, uh, venture. But is that going to essentially hit, help everybody come up with a platform like this or um, uh, help everybody get back into business or not go out of business? I wouldn't think so. Thank you, uh, Milhan. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for that insight. I have uh, got a couple of uh, important questions uh, through uh, from the audience, and I think it's really important to get that. So, Bruno, let me come to you because I think, uh, I don't know, for some reason, rightly or wrongly, I think you're a, uh, the right person for this question. <laughs> Uh, if you look at the government as your provider supplier, I'm just reading the question out which I just uh, posted. How do you expect the government to reimagine you as a customer and understand your needs and expectations? I think they're talking about general public who technically the governments are expected to service. Uh, I think are not, not organization we represent per se. As citizens, uh, how do you expect government to reimagine and what are your thoughts on that? Because I believe you must be having to deal with some of these things on a daily basis. Mm, yeah, thank you. Uh, look, I think uh, I, I would echo a few things. I would echo that what we've said before. So I will build on the discussion we had about how can they make sure that they listen to me as a citizen? What do I need? Uh, where do, I, where do I feel that I need support uh, and make sure that with the, all the data points and, and the government has a lot of data. So uh, be led with data and try to understand that data. So try to understand better the citizen, where they are, what they want to do, what they need from the government. Second step is I think, uh, and, and, and in UAE, we're maybe, uh, uh, that may be the, the, the perfect 
very good exception is time to market, time to decision, times to uh, times to implement new solution. We're definitely we're lucky in this country where some decisions are, are, are making very fast. We're very uh, digital market already in this, but I would say so. I'm not sure which country uh, is this. Uh, uh, I would say uh, focusing on, but I would say make a story short, trying to make sure that I listen more, try to understand what's needed. Back to what we said about understanding the customer. Uh, and second is everything I want, I would deliver. I want to make sure that the time to market is less than X weeks because by the time you are engaging into that product, <laughs> uh, the, the, the market is changing so fast. So that would be the two things that I would expect uh, a government or, or even though a, a civil kind of customers to, to take care of. Excellent. Uh, Patrick, any comments on that? or? Would you like to add something for that question? Um, on governments, uh, I don't have a lot of experience because I'm, a I'm of course, in the mid-market. Um, but uh, generally, I, I, uh, I agree with uh, with Bruno. Um, I think governments have to treat uh, the citizens more as, as consumers, right, in the end. So that means that um, they have to um, jump onto the same bandwagon like the, like the normal um, uh, enterprises that are offering services, um, but they need to make it easy to um, consume. Yeah, they need to make the provider an end-to-end -end service. It needs to be uh, digital. They also want to make sure that uh, um, people don't come uh, to the customer services centers uh, and uh, maintain, um, uh, uh, first of all, a low cost in in, in servicing those uh, those customer centers. But also, of course, during the time of pandemic, let's hope it doesn't last much longer. But during that time, of course, you also want to make sure that. Uh, um, uh, that uh, you keep the foot traffic low, right? And, and low tax. And low tax. <laughs> <Correct>. <laughs> That's an important one, yeah. I I just realized, I, I don't know whether this is fact or fiction, but uh, Sri Lanka tends to uh, um, have one of the lowest uh, taxes in the world. I don't know if that's what everybody claims. Uh, so maybe, gentlemen, you can think about it. So, Ramesh. Uh, <laughs> No, and if I may to add, I think Estonia and Singapore are good examples for e-citizen services. And I think Dubai is fast catching up. I think the, the primary need for any of these is to have a digital ID for the stakeholder, right? Whether it's a citizen, whether it's a customer. Again, I think if you want to really give a personalized service, do you have a digital ID for your customer? How does it translate in terms of a data point for your organization? Right. I think that would be the first question for us to grapple with uh, if you are trying to stage a data driven organization around the customer. So, Ramesh, but I think let me continue uh, to ask you this question because again, this is a question we have received from the uh, audience. Uh, it talks a little bit about the CEOs are considering evolving digital transformation rollouts in terms of business to everything, B to E. Um, and uh, I'm assuming it is B2C or oh, no, business to everything. Everything. And, yeah, and uh, it's sustainability in this pandemic. Would you like to share some thoughts? And maybe I'll come back, come to Milan also for the for some thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think the, the whole question, I, I don't know whether what is getting framed, is it maybe around the full thing, right? Whether post pandemic, whether this need will prolong or not, right? So that is where you got to pivot. So maybe post pandemic people might rush back to the petrol sheds. Right, and may not want people getting delivered home. So the, the question is that assumption that we are saying, hey, this is a need, a customer need which could sustain even beyond the pandemic. So the assumption is how do you make it sticky? How do I convert this service which is kind of become a need during pandemic to sustain itself? Right. So the that is where the data points would be useful. Now, if I can say a person, if I take the full example, say Okay, I'll take Bruno for example. Bruno Fool, his uh, SUV last Sunday, and most likely, and, and he called me again this Sunday. I know that every week he will need to get refueled. So without him ordering, I can say, hey, I can refuel you next Sunday. Pick the options in terms of what is a suitable time for you, right? So I could then use his data points, trend his consumption patterns, and then see, start predicting that he's going to consume every Sunday and say, okay, this convenient time would be 3 a.m. in the morning, right? So I could then also try to build around what more vehicle does he have at his home front? His wife might be having an SUV, so I could 
then start building a, a client profile around Bruno. Right. So the yeah. whole issue is in terms of because I know the relation between Bruno and his Bruno's household, there are three people, whatever. I could then start stitching the need of, of the full need around him. And then it could extend to his office, it could extend to his apartment or the location where he lives. Right. So that is where I think the the business to everything getting built is all about data right? and building the relationships and predicting demand and then creating the dwarf factor. Great, Ramesh. Thank you. Milan, would you like to add some comments to that? Uh, because uh, you have to probably do this on a daily basis. Uh, you know, transformation rollout, as Ramesh said, you have taken some bold steps uh, in terms of really starting the journey. I'm sure the journey was started, but some significant investment, especially at a time like this. Yeah. Well, that was the easiest thing. I mean, like I just had to go with my flow of being crazy in the decisions. So that was really not a very difficult decision, I would say. Right. But with respect to um, uh, uh, digital transformation, um, I, I think, again, this has two parts. Um, there are those who need to take this seriously so that they can see how uh, that can play a serious role in terms of delivering um, convenience, um, delivering economies of scale, as well as um, shorter deliverance times of uh, uh, what is being offered. Um, I believe it was uh, uh, Patrick, if I'm not mistaken, uh, with uh, uh, Bruno, uh, who had stated something to the effect when you're able to offer a lot of services online, um, you could uh, make yourself available uh, in terms of delivering that service rather than wait for you to physically travel. I am a little old school, so I kind of like to sit in front of somebody, see them in the eye and then get my thing done. But yes, given the circumstances. But if you also look at how governments are doing it, if I just uh, uh, go back a little bit to the previous question, um, the leadership here, uh, they, they've got a fantastic uh, think tank, uh, uh, which gives them uh, valuable insight. And, and they really look at how uh, uh, doing, doing things uh, from a digital platform as well as from a commercial perspective. So the leadership here in this country in UAE is very committed. Even if I give you an example, when, when you have a lot of imports, you, you do have to pay 5% VAT. Um, when you have something in the range of 100, 200, 300 million, that 5% does essentially translate into something of significance anywhere from 5 to um, 50 million. Um, if, you, if you are doing that in a month, I would say that's a significant amount of cash flow. So what the government actually has done is they've simplified it to the extent that they just generate an electronic credit at the point of import. And then they say, just finish off whatever that you're doing. At the end of the quarter, calculate the entire output VAT that you've got. And this input that you got brought in, they don't make the companies or the importers pay that amount as liquid cash outflow. So it's just given as an electronic credit against which they generate another electronic debit because you actually have to pay it. So the input VAT actually gets set off and you end up paying your output VAT well after you've collected at least some part of what you have sold. So this greatly helps a lot of organizations in terms of their cash flow and keeps a very good electronic record rather than having to depend on other conventional means. And even if you look at a lot of other government services, I think they've handled this situation extremely well, limiting the number of people having to go to government offices, whether it be the Dubai municipality, whether it is the government organization such as Mohri, which is the Ministry of Human uh, uh, Rights and uh, uh, Resources and Emiratization, which handles all of the labor, Ministry of Labor related uh, affairs. So I think yeah. they've done a wonderful job. Excellent. So I think, uh... Let me thanks, Milhan. I mean, I really appreciate that. I think you covered the first point as well as the um, the second one. Uh, we are definitely at the tail end of our webinar. It's been uh, almost one hour, 15 minutes. So thanks a lot. I just have a couple of quick questions uh, that I think I want to make sure that we cover during the webinar. So let me just come back and finish those and then we'll do a round of uh, closing remarks to wrap up the webinar for today. I hope everyone who had uh, joined uh, gained some uh, very insightful thoughts and uh, you know inputs about 
really this topic about you know how do we really look at the customers and what are the ground level realities of dealing with this and how organizations need to start thinking about from a culture and uh, process standpoint um so maybe i'll just come back to bruno for you i mean just want to have you uh, answer this particular specific question about business models um you know business models are obviously constantly evolving and obviously uh it's one of those things that you need to be altering all the time even more than uh, the faster than how people could actually adapt to it uh, but of course the need for this real time uh, being able to engage even us as uh, you know individuals working for organization the level of stream of whatsapp messages that we need to keep up with is a, is a constantly it's a is a significant amount of uh, kind of a challenge and opportunity depending on the on the virtual spectrum of it you look at um in the technology industry oftentimes this had been the key to success uh oftentimes keeping and driving the customer engagement with your team is a major challenge even though it is uh that opportunity uh, how do you advise leaders to go about managing this pace at which things are happening right now hmm. i think yes as you said market are changing extremely rapidly uh, and potentially business model because customer customer also are asking more I don't know if I could advise leaders but um, uh what I think we try to do and what I try to do is as a leader try to maximize uh, even in this tough time what I what I call customer or partner it's no more facing time even though we can see each other but connection time so uh, it's very important that I think as leader we don't Uh, stay disconnected too long from from what are those business model what what they can do i think we have to uh, be innovative in terms of new business model and uh, i don't know if you remember i was saying that how do we reflect the customer integration uh, interaction sorry versus uh, a partner interaction so i can how can i help a customer big business with his end customer more than how can i do business with him okay if you understand what i mean more i would say uh, a win-win partnership so i think from a leader standpoint we should be able to have uh, our investment we should have to make sure we we can put our people our money etc so i think that's really something that i would um, uh, advise them and last is that uh, that's a little bit link with what uh, milan was saying about some some decision that could be very critical in terms of uh, business sustainability and sometimes uh, go there um think you have think fast think fast but but execute uh, because at the end of the day again I, when i look at some of my partners uh, there are some people that have been extremely agile in changing their business model and again i want to uh, also uh, look at you guys of how you are capable of of delivering across the region um and i can easily imagine that it's not easy from a technology from scaling from everything all right so i think think fast but but execute so at some point of stage only execution matters uh, rest is hallucination so from the leader we need to make sure that 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 we stay focused on execution last example i have as as a customer uh, during this pandemic in dubai there was a lot of online online i would say shoppers and website but very few at stock okay they they right. they had they were in the situation where everybody was there but reality they said oh they had a beautiful online shop but the reality they were they were absolutely no stock so every time you wanted to order chicken or duck or whatever the guy was saying hey you have three days to wait uh, no because i need it now and 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 i think that's where i think we always need to reflect about our core business what is our core business our core assets our core differentiation and let's double down on it Thanks uh, Bruno I think let me come back to you Patrick for the probably the last uh, question before we do the closing remarks um what according to what Bruno said mentioned about you know delivering this uh, you know kind of a you know meeting this challenge with in terms of keeping up with uh, you know the fast pace of technology and what's going on uh, obviously we touched briefly previously also about the need for uh, you know kind of managing culture and making it kind of propagate through the organization um you know it's more like uh, what i would the term we use is called ecos um so with your experience uh, how do you think organizations can be enabled to deliver this and uh, what is the role that do you think ecosystem partners can play in putting all of this together
yeah, so I think in, you're on uh, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I think in general, of course, it comes down to uh, culture, as Bruno said, uh, and also uh, ability to execute. Right. One thing is to have a great vision, uh, but ability to execute um, is uh, is where the rubber meets the road. Um, and I'm actually quite surprised how resilient a lot of uh, uh, companies have been in this uh, crisis, because I think most of us did not see it coming. Right. It basically happened within a time span of two, three, four weeks. And then all of a sudden we were in lockdown in most countries. Uh, some countries now have the second or third wave. Um, and uh, yeah, the majority of businesses are coping. Of course, some businesses have uh, failed or are in the process of failing um, where they now try to manage uh, cash. Uh, cash pres uh, preservation is at the top of their minds. Um, others have adopted business models. Others are uh, starting projects now to be prepared. Uh, even if this takes longer, um, and of course the employees play a play a key a key role here, and a lot of employees have also been impacted. I mean, we've had uh, people whose uh, families uh, um, have been impacted, their way of life has been impacted. Um, working from home for for months is is is, is a difficult uh, thing to do, right? I mean, we all got used to it now, but um, in the end, how do you execute in such an environment where you can't see your teams? <clears throat> And I think uh, we, we all uh, learned in this uh, in this climate uh, to become a lot more agile uh, and a lot more responsive, and uh, to deal with the hardship. Yeah, um, I mean, I think most of us uh, still are on the on the sunny side of things in this uh, in this pandemic. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I think uh, the way that uh, most businesses have have, have responded is pretty impressive. Um, and in terms of how ecosystem uh, partners help, I mean, SAP, we have 100,000 employees. Um, we, we, we are primarily a, a software company, right? So we like to develop products and we like uh, to get customers to adopt them. Um, and uh, the ecosystem is uh, tremendously important because they provide the value to the customer, right? They understand the customer, they understand the requirements the customer has, um, and they, they are the ones that design the application uh, for the customer with the customer's needs in mind. And um, I think specifically um, now um, we, we've seen customers that use the pandemic uh, to um, when they have maybe a little bit of uh, lower business activity, yeah, they use the pandemic to um, roll out a new project uh, and start uh, the um, uh, technology adoption. Um, also because it has become a lot easier um, over the last few years, right? With cloud, um, I don't need a technician to come on site to configure my, my, my infrastructure. A lot of the work can be done remotely by ecosystem partners, uh, and it starts with requirements gathering that can be done remotely. Um, you can build an application and configure it remotely. Um, you can design it remotely. Uh, majority of it can be built uh, remotely, and of course, you can also test it remotely. Um, so a lot of this typical application um, uh, life cycle um, is uh, is now uh, or can be done uh, remotely online. Excellent. And of course, that's where the ecosystem partners play a very important role because we don't have the capacity to do that on a large scale. Great. Thank you, Patrick. I'm, and as I said, I mean, time is never on our side. There's a quite a lot of other questions that I would have loved to ask, but I think what we're going to do is we have about seven more minutes. So I won't like to do a, um, do a closing remarks. But before we do the closing remarks, Milan, I'll come, come to you. I think there's a specific question there asked uh, about. Uh, uh, let me read out the question and maybe you can give the answer and also give your closing remarks, Milhan, and then I will come around uh, for the rest of the panelists for the closing remarks. Uh, one of the, uh, Milhan, the question says that one of the impacted segments due to pandemic is leisure hotels. Uh, and uh, I would say that a lot more other industries as well. Uh, the question is, uh, how can an organization like Magenta group leverage technology uh, with Microsoft with SAP um, to find uh, new business models and uh, in these challenging times. Would you like to give up maybe a brief answer and maybe then we can uh, do, go do a closing remark with that, Milha? Well, um, uh, Rohan, I think uh, like I had mentioned in the beginning, um, well, we are essentially focused uh, uh, around the central focal point of uh, making an impact on uh, the food lifestyle of people. So there's a lot of um, understanding uh, to try and grasp uh, with regards to uh, consumption patterns, what uh, the needs of the consumers are. Um, whilst also I believe uh, there is a great deal of visibility which is needed because at a time like this, every single um, dirham or every single dollar spent or not spent 
makes a whole world of a difference. So um, visibility is key, timeliness, uh, uh, and to be able to run certain models where you can actually try and predict the numbers before they occur. Um, this uh, uh, way of uh, using technology um, is not a, is not something that became new during the pandemic, but then um, I think the relevance of applying it um, as accurately as possible um, at a time like this uh, could make a difference of uh, uh, success uh, and hopefully not failure. Um, with that, I'd like to extend my thanks to um, uh, uh, the the organizers, uh, John Keel's uh, IT. Um, uh, I've, we've had a fantastic session, I believe, with uh, SAP uh, uh, Patrick and uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Bruno, as well as uh, John Keel's being represented by Ramesh and uh, uh, Rohan on this session. Um, yes, I, I believe uh, uh, these are great uh, people to listen to. We've had some very nice, um, interesting uh, insights and thoughts. It was an honor and my pleasure to be um, given this opportunity to listen to uh, what these gentlemen had to say. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Good hunting. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, Milhan. Really appreciate it. Let me next come to uh, Patrick for your closing remarks. Yeah, I think uh, uh, in general, um, we've had this pandemic and it was, uh, in my view, was an accelerator um, of many things, right? So it's uh, an accelerator of technology adoption, also an accelerator for um, um, behavioral changes. I mean, we've had um, remote working, we've had rapidly shifting uh, consumer behavior to e-commerce. Uh, there's been disruptions in supply chains um, and a lot of uh, companies are engaging in um, liquidity preservation efforts. So I, I think a lot of these things will stick. Um, and uh, I think the role of technology in um, in managing uh, these aspects and also in uh, in um, dealing with the changed uh, customer behavior is is going to be bigger in the future so i think a lot of it will stick and uh, agility to respond uh, stays key yeah thank you bruno over to you yeah thank you uh, again as milan said thank you very much for having us great discussion lots of things covered most probably a lot of questions let's uh, Juan, let's make uh, sure that if we can uh, even offline, answer the question to the to the pen, to the people. I am at your disposal. First, second, look, uh, time is now. Time is now for for everyone to really uh, go and reflect about where they stand in the market. Uh, starting with us, uh, time is now to kick some project. As Patrick was saying, the beauty of the situation these days is that we don't need a, a heavy technology to start piloting things. So. Uh, I hope you're ready, uh, guys, John Keels, to receive all of this, but uh, I know you are. Um, but thank you for having us. And of course, uh, we're going to be with you guys to uh, to deliver the best uh, customer experience uh, in this region uh, and, and elsewhere in the world. Thank you for having me. And that was lovely. And uh, I hope it was valuable for the, for the people remotely. Absolutely. Thank you. thank you. Ramesh, over to you. Yeah, I think at, at the onset, I did mention that customer centricity and customer experience is a journey. And uh, today it's all about hyper relevance. It's a journey as well. So hyper relevance is about the five P's, uh, uh, the purpose, pride, the partnership, the protection and personalization. Right. So having said that, it's, it's always a journey. And uh, I think we got a formidable partnership with uh, Microsoft, SAP and John Society to fulfill, fulfill your journey on uh, hyper relevance. So stay relevant, stay blessed, stay safe. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been an absolute privilege for me uh, to listen to you and uh, host you guys. Um, thank you so much for your inputs and guidance. Milan, always a pleasure to have you as our customer collectively. Uh, so gentlemen once again thank you very much thank you very much for everyone who has been listening i hope you got something really positive out of this uh, and as bruno said it's time to action it's time to take it to the next level all the best stay safe thank you very much <laughs>